I'm with Lord David Putnam, who's one of the keynote speakers at TNC 2014. And uh, Lord Putnam, one of the things that you mentioned in your talk was a report produced by the European Commission, uh, European Union in 2013 about um, children's use of technology in education. And you said that some of the information in there was shocking. Maybe you can just start by saying what was so shocking uh, to you. Well, they did a snapshot of, um, of five, five countries. It was called uh, uh, School Kids Go Mobile, uh, Net, Net Kids Go Mobile. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think it was shocking. I mean, what I, the ones I read out was 53% um, of nine to 16 year olds here in Ireland uh, say they never or almost never use the internet at school. I mean, that is extraordinary, 53%. Uh, frightening one, uh, last but not least, only 20% of young Irish men and women use the internet for any aspect of their schoolwork at all in the past month. Um, it's uh, the notion that, you know, we've worked, all of us have worked extremely hard and invested huge sums of money in trying to get connectivity into the schools and that somehow that our schools are just not responding to that, not using the resource they have. That, sh that does shock me. So why is it that you think that ICT should be more used or even that uh, should be seen to be important to be more used in education? Because this is, ICT represents the world that these young people live in and will continue to live in. Uh, they don't live and there's no point in getting you know, sort of sentimental about this. They do not live in the world of books. I was brought up in the world of books. I love books. Uh, but to get my granddaughter to read a book is really quite difficult. On the other hand, she, can sp she deals with her iPad with a lot more facility than I do. She's eight years old. It is completely natural to, us, uh, to her. And uh, one of the delegates here today was pointing out that his three-year-old gets hold of a book and can't understand why they can't swipe it. They find it because so it doesn't. So they think it's something that doesn't work because it won't swipe. Mm. Now to try and, as it were, argue against or fight against that, or somehow to pretend that that's uh, going to make them lesser human beings is, I think, it's an, uh, an adult fantasy. Mm. So it's a question of equipping children properly with the skills that they're going to need and the confidence that they're going to need to use the tools that are going to be available to and them. And to understand the way in which they will use them to acquire the knowledge that they believe they need to navigate their way through their own lives. It'll be somewhat different to, certainly massively different to mine. And basically, in, you've, you've been saying that education is effectively the poor cousin in this respect with regard to public expenditure. Uh, so in what ways does it compare with other areas? Well, what inter interests me is that... Uh, for example, if ever there's a threat of, uh, of, of some existential threat of terrorism, or whatever, um, a whole series of budgets get increased. Defence budgets get increased. Surveillance budgets get increased. Uh, and yet, the most existential threat is an ill-educated or under-educated generation of young people. And that's but that expenditure is seen as fungible. Uh, and I illustrated it with a chart from uh, Korea, where it's the one country. Uh, Denmark's done well, uh, Sweden's done well, and Estonia tends to have done well, where there is a consistent investment, upward investment in education. Because, as I said in my speech, the most important thing I said, only a brilliantly educated generation of young people are going to give us, you, me, my family, affordable pensions, affordable health care, affordable lives. It's not going to come from anywhere else. You can, you know, brilliant developments will take place in health, but they in themselves are not self-funding. Only education and the results and, 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 and the fruits of education are what's going to fund the type of sustainable future that we want. So why is it, do you think, that there is this gap between the need uh, to recognise what education uh, needs from, ed from the use of ICT and, and, and the public <coughs> expenditure, expenditure that goes into it? Because we in the West have developed a system of democracy which is increasingly find it impossible to make long-term commitments and long-term and deal with long-term issues. Uh, climate change would be another one. Uh, basically, we are, and the democratic systems we've uh, we've chosen, are the are constant, constantly being pulled backwards and forwards by overnight um, public opinion, and that isn't the way that you create sustainable societies. It, it can't work that way. So the the media, the demands of the media, the 24-hour news cycle, uh, the, the fear of not being elected next time around, all these things mitigate against serious, sensible, long-term investment. So if you could pick, say, your top three priorities or recommendations for what should be done either more generally in society or more specifically within the area of policy and public expenditure to start redressing this uh, imbalance, 
Where would you start? Well, I'd start at the, around the cabinet table, which is, I said, the 7th century set to the minimum. I start with uh, an assumption that 7% is the absolute minimum if you spend on education. I try and spend it as wisely as I could, but I also make another assumption, which is that over a period of 15 years, that figure will be 10%. So I'd be looking at an upward trajectory and a constant reinvestment and improvement in my in my in, in, in education. I'd understand that uh, I was trying to squeeze the lemon too much with my with the teachers I've got, but unless I ensure that they are extraordinarily well trained, trained extraordinarily well motivated and continually involve themselves in professional practice and, and, and professional improvements that mirror the changes that are taking place, that they, I'm on a hiding to nothing. So I'd know that I have to invest there. Um, and I'd have to go to the country and explain that there was no alternative, that if, if they had remote interest in the futures of their grandchildren, let alone their children, their grandchildren, then this was the investment that had to be made. Mm. Uh, so I think that uh, it would all be wrapped up in, in that discussion and that component of persuasiveness. You say go to the country, but I think part of your point is this is not just one country we're talking yeah. about. This is actually typical across many countries. Yes, but unfortunately, uh, as you probably know, the, uh, education has devolved power from within the EU, so it's extremely difficult for the European Commission to do men much more than offer exemplars. So the Erasmus programme, they, they can fund and offer exam examples and hope that other uh, you know, member nations, member states, take those examples up. But they've got no, no ability to even look at or discuss the possibility of changing the curriculum of, of individual countries. So there's a, there's a kind of wall, there's a kind of call on sanitaire around education, which in some respects may be defensible, but in other respects is just, uh, is actually quite damaging. How do you envisage that organizations that are involved in the technology side, the technological development side, the e-infrastructure side, the national research and education networking side of things can actually help with achieving this turnaround? Well, uh, I was lucky enough to go and listen in February to Bill Gates talking about the work of the Gates Foundation. What I'd like to see is the big corporates, Google, um, Apple, the rest, setting aside a really, really significant uh, sum, which we could call, if you like, R&D, but actually would be dedicated to, it's entirely dedicated to improvements in global education. Because were I the, a shareholder, I wish, I wish I was a shareholder, but were I a shareholder, I would see that as almost the best way of ensuring a long-term, a really long-term uh, return on my investment. Unfortunately, the investment community doesn't see the world that way. The investment community looks at quarterly earnings and half-yearly earnings and uh, you know, a, a good CEO who had exactly the right dreams and ideals for his business would find themselves under extreme pressure if they weren't delivering exactly what, the, uh, the, the, what Wall Street and the City of London require. These two things are at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. So responsible capitalism, responsible capitalism, finds itself at odds with the demands of the marketplace. And that's not, in my judgment, that is not a sustainable situation. And what about the publicly funded organisations such as the National Research and Education Networks? They're very important, but as I, my sort of small, small slight critique, if you like, as someone who did chair a, a research organisation, is that <coughs> researchers, by their very nature, like projects. They like s relatively small-scale things they can control, so they'll do a project in a school or maybe three schools, a group of schools, and that project might be extremely successful. But, but then when you say to that same person, same person, OK, I now need that to work at 6,000 schools, uh, they basically look at you and say, well, that's someone else's job. I don't, that's not what I do. Uh, and they really want to go back to another, a new, and very interesting project. Uh, and the way I described it in a thing I did the other day on television was it's a little bit liking, uh, like asking someone who's designing a supersonic aircraft to actually engage in the riveting of the, rings, of the, of the wings to make absolutely sure that their vision uh, can, be, can be created. That's not what they do. And I think that's a, not a particularly good, good analogy. But um, I would like to see a generation of uh, educational researchers uh, and ICT experts come together with a view to how can we change things at scale, not how can we come up with a wizard idea that will work for a few people. Well, hopefully we can uh, try and address those challenges in future. Thank you very much. I'd be delighted to be part of it. Thank you very much for having me.